Donc lundi, ça va être un autre exposé. Hein. Lundi, ça va être un autre exposé. Lundi, à Paris 7, ça va être un autre exposé. Et en fait, comment tu vas faire en fait, pour Paris 7 tu vas, euh, tu vas aller à quelle heure en fait, Parce que tu m'as donné la salle, c'est à 4h30. C'est à 4h30, oui. Ouais. Euh, en fait, c'est facile, c'est juste que tu vas au, cinqui... c'est au cinquième étage, non, euh, non. Là où il a les maths ou c'est... Non, non, c'est pas... Le... Ok, bon, je vais... Bon, a priori, je compte venir depuis chez moi pour... Five minutes lunch. No, it's c'est juste un, c'est juste un petit, c'est juste un petit good. Okay. Uh, so I would like to thank the. I would like to thank the, <laughs> the organizers for uh, the invitation to this uh, very nice uh, meeting. Uh, so I, I, I learned many things from, from the previous talks. Uh, so I was very happy to see some people I never, I never met. I just knew some, read some of their papers. For instance, I read some of your lecture notes. So I was happy to see you in life. Uh, and, uh, So yeah, I'm very happy to be here and to make uh, to see new people, uh, which uh, is a kind of refreshment for me. Actually, I, for family reasons, I don't go often to workshops, so I'm really happy to be a bit in a different uh, surrounding. Uh, okay, so I I am afraid my talk is not really <laughs> in the main theme of the conference. So, uh, but hopefully uh, there you will find some connections to what you know, to things you know. So I will talk about uh, solving uh, uh, NLS type equations. So an equation of the type as in Andre talk with uh, white noise initial data, which means with very singular initial data. And so what I will talk is a joint work with Tadahiro O, who is in, uh, sorry, who is in, uh, Know how works the pointer? Ah, yeah, here, here, okay. Who is in University of Edinburgh? And Yu Zhao Wang, who is in uh, University of uh, Birmingham. So, as you see, it's a kind of modern manifestation of the Entente Cordiale, Bulgarian Chinese collaboration. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to show you uh, what I mean by the white noise on the circle. And so, this is something uh, which can be defined at least in two ways. So, uh, uh, Anne already talked about this. So, it is a Gaussian process such that the covariance matrix is identity. So, it, a Gaussian measure such with covariance matrix identity formally. It's this. And also there is the, the co- co- correlation definition unused in her talk. So I will use more concrete definition. Actually, the first one will be the important for my talk. So let us fix GN to be a family of independent standard complex Gaussian variables. So maybe I should say what I mean by complex uh, ra- Gaussian variable. It means simply something like this. So. where H and N dependent and uh, in real valued Gaussian. So that's what I mean by standard Gaussian. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. There is one I. And uh, then uh, once I have such a family, 
of random variables. Of course, this is already uh, not obvious that you have such a family, but once we know that I have such a family, I can define the white noise on the circle as the distribution of the random variable uh, defined by the following uh, random series. So in all my talk, u omega of x will be this random series. So I have the usual, the usual for, uh, exponential, Fourier base of exponentials. And I defined each exponential uh, multiplied by independent Gaussians. So it's infinite product of independent Gaussians. And so, okay, it's very nice to write this series, but of course it's very singular series because the Fourier coefficients are not decaying at all. In fact, they grow. <laughs> they grow like log of n, as you know, sequence of independent Gaussians. So for, it is really a big problem because such kind of things are not really functions. They are, in fact, distributions. And uh, so the way I, we should see the thing is that we have the map which to omega give this distribution effect. Uh, and actually, I can even be more precise. This distribution lives in the Sobolev space HS as very small, smaller than minus one half. Uh, and so Sobolev space, uh, of course, are nice because if I take the union of all Sobolev spaces, I take all, all uh, periodic distributions of period to pi. So, okay, this object lives in negative Sobolev space, uh, HS, S more than minus one half. And in fact, it cannot be seen as a, this, as a random variable with velocity H minus one half because it's almost surely infinite in H minus one half. So what we see is that the map induces such a random variable and uh, the distribution of this random variable is, uh, is, uh, is our white noise. And in fact, uh, our goal will be, in fact, to solve some PDE with such initial data. And uh, if it was a linear PDE, somehow we know how to do it since uh, many years. But for nonlinear PDE, it's a problem. So this is a way to see the white noise from the Fourier side. But we can also see it in the physical space, in fact. And this is a, 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 a way to see it. So using the central limit theorem, we can see, in fact, this measure, the measure on HS, as actually the uh, weak limit as n goes to infinity of the distributions of these random variables. So these are HS random variables. As you know, the delta functions are exactly in HS, S more than minus 1 half. So I can see some of independent copy of this random variable. Uh, I will explain, it's written after. Uh, so Xn is uh, distributed according to the uniform measure on the torus, okay? So if you take uh, this sum of uh, delta functions according to the uniform measure on the torus times some zero mean variables with uh, uh, what I need for Xi, I say I take it Gaussian, but what I need really is to be of zero mean and with uh, variance one. So for instance, plus minus one will be okay. And so uh, uh, if you see this random variable, so I will not make the computation, but it is a one-like computation. If you compute the covariance matrix of this one, this is the identity. I mean, if you apply this to a text function and you take the expectation of this to one text function and another text function, T uh, test function, you will trivial. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, what I say is trivial. That this the distribution of this uh, 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 of this sum uh, converges to the white noise of the circle. It's, for me, it's trivial. I don't know. It should be well known. It is uh, just. I will not use this thing, but I would just to say that we can also see it in the physical space, not only on Fourier space. And so I like these two ways. In my talk, I will use mainly uh, only this one, but this is good to have in mind. And actually, there is a freedom. As I say, xi can be many variables, and also delta function is not the best idea. I think for the Schrodinger equation, it's better to have to think about wave packets uh, and things like this, right? Actually, this one is good for Euler equation. And uh, uh, actually, 
you, you know that uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you, uh, recently there is a remarkable paper by Franco Flandoli where he solves the Euler equation with white noise initial, like actually uh, analogous result of what I will explain for the Euler equation where he proved less of compared to what I will tell you, but his way to see the white noise was this one. And so I actually am I'm inspired by his paper when I write this, okay? But this is a way, the, and I think that in the Schrodinger equation world on this Hamiltonian, maybe it's a promising direction to try to use this kind of approximation and see what survives from Euler equation in the context of, uh, of such kind of Schrodinger things. But it's more as a kind of uh, for future directions as, uh, Talk. Uh, just to say that we can also see the white noise as a limit in the physical space, and I think it's not explored enough. So for the moment, there is no PD in my talk, right? There is only uh, some uh, uh, measure in HS, or if you prefer, some Gaussian measure in some very negative space. How this measure is uh, connected to PD? So. The, the connection comes, how, how this white noise is connected to PDE. The point is that if we use the L2 norm on the circle in terms of the Fourier coefficient, one can formally define the previously defined measure as, uh, as this one. Why? Because if you take a function on the torus, as you know, we can develop in Fourier, in, uh, Fourier series, and then if I identify the function with the sequence of the Fourier coefficient, and we know that the L2 norm square is essentially the sum of Cn square. So if I look at something like, so this formal expression should be understood as, uh, if I put the, the equivalent thing, it's exponential minus And the u, I can write it as a product of the c, so it starts to, to behave a little bit like measure, right? <laughs> if I identify the u as the, the product of the measure on each coefficient, and here, of course, this, this uh, L2 norm gives some, uh, some Gaussian measure on each coefficient. Of course, this t doesn't work. I need here to multiply by 2p, right, or something like this, so to make it... Uh, to, on each product, okay, I see it like this. And then, of course, I can continue and develop the exponential of the sum ex product of exponential, and I can start to see this as, right? So the problem is this is not a probability measure because the 2p factor is missing, right? And so that's why I put this z to the power minus one, it's actually infinity, right? Uh, because everywhere I should put some factor two p, and this is the, the uh, sorry, oh, sorry, one over two p, and then to co compensate, this is multiplied by two times p, right? And this makes that actually, this is what when we call, we need to, to put this z minus one. It's not exactly probability measure, but modulus this two pi is a probability measure. And actually, what we know how to define is such a product, right? The infinite product of probability measures. And so we see that, in fact, the, the white noise can be naturally seen as this Gaussian measure effect in very negative Sobolev space. And in fact, uh, uh, it is true that the measure I write in this formal way and the measure given as sum of random variables in that way are the same, in fact. But if I write it like this, I make a connection to PDE. Because if I have a PDE such that the L2 norm is conserved and such that which is Hamiltonian, which means that the volume element is conserved, then I can hope to have this measure as an invariant measure. But of course, in order to do so, I should solve my PD with this crazy, initial, this very singular initial data. And if I have a way to solve it, uh, then uh, th I, I'll be, I will solve my, my problem. And in fact, there are many important Hamiltonian PD, uh, so, uh, which are conserving the L2 norm. For instance, the KDV equation, 
is, is uh, for instance, you have KDV, which conserves the O2 norm. You also have, uh, say, the nonlinear Schrodinger, which will be my, my, my subject today. So here it's real valid function, and here is, uh, so this is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So here are two PDE preserving the L2 norm, and so for this PDE, we may hope to solve them with this initial data and have the white noise as uh, invariant measure. Of course, all this is to be precise, and I hope in the next two slides, I will explain you what, what this means, because of course, when we solve nonlinear PD with such data, we should really be careful what we talk about. And then, uh, uh, I just should mention that the whole difficulty is in the local in time theory, because uh, if you solve, have a good local in time theory, there is a general globalization argument introduced 25 years ago by Borgen, which says that once you solve locally the problem with such a data, there is a way to exploit the invariance of the measure as a conservation law to pass from local to global solution. And uh, therefore, the, the issue is to, to show to solve loc locally in time the problem with such data, for instance, nonlinear Schroeder equation or KDV. So let us try to formulate the result. So in, my goal is in the next five, 10 minutes to formulate the results. And then I will see what I will explain on the proof. So of my goal will be to solve the, pro uh, just to be quick, the problem I discussed is already solved for KDV since 20, 15 years maybe, but it's still open for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And uh, what I will do. That's what I'm saying. For KDV, it is solved. Right. But, but uh, for focusing and defocusing, for both? I am not uh, aware. Uh, for, okay, so f already for the defocus, but even for the defocusing case, I'm not aware of the result you talk about. Ah, okay, so, okay. Uh, let us put it with minus sum to, to be the focusing case, okay. But uh, it's not written, okay. So, uh, uh, okay, even, uh, this is a good point. Uh, even if they solved the problem in negative Sobolev spaces, it's not yet done. I will explain you why, okay? But uh, as you say, we are very near, so, uh, but uh, indeed, <laughs> I should be careful. There is a book by Kapeler and Greber wh where they, they consider, but do they solve it in minus one? I think they saw it in L2. Because this, uh, this data, as I explained in my first slide, belongs to H minus one half minus epsilon for every epsilon almost surely. So the initial data is of regularity H minus one. So le let us say the things like this. I, maybe integrability will do the, the business, but it is not done yet. And I personally, of course, uh, uh, but even if they do it, there is uh, work to be done, okay? It's not absolutely immediate. But uh, we, uh, we approach the problem without integrability, and I will explain you, it's nice discussion maybe later. Even if you solve it by integrability methods, the approximation you will use will be different. I will try to emphasize on this point. So even if one day we solve the method by the integrability or by the method I suggest, the two solutions will not be a priori the same. I will try to explain you later uh, why. Because here we are in a situation where the solution depends on the approximation I take on the initial data. That's the, ver the, the definition of these supercritical problems as we did with Nicola Burkwitz for the wave equation. So we are in situations where the solution you obtain depends on the way you approximate the initial data. If you approximate in one way, you get something. If approximate in another way, you choose the counter example of Lebo, you take infinity. So I believe we are, we are in such a world where the object itself depends on the approximation. Like for singular stochastic PDE, we always 
con make convolution of the noise with uh, noise with with convolution. If you take other approximation, I think we have no limit. Or they didn't explore this direction, but I'm pretty sure it depends on this type of approximation. So here we have similar thing for NLS, but not for KDP. Okay, let us. Uh, it's interesting point we can discuss. But since by the methods I know, we cannot solve the problem for the true NLS. We will take more dispersion. And for such a problem, as you will see, we can solve the problem. That's the main result. But let us see what we can solve. Let us be very, very careful because the formulation of the result is important. And these issues of approximations are also important to be understood. So the first good thing here is that so I will take my model to be the what I call for NLS. It means I take more more dispersion. And then there is a first good news. We can solve this problem for regular initial data, <laughs> for L2, for instance. So we can solve this data problem for data which is in HS as big or equal than zero. But we, any, for instance, for say infinity data, we can define nice global solution. So once my philosophy is that once I'm in such a situation, the solutions I obtain for singular data should be connected to the regular flow. And somehow there should be limits of the regular flow. Otherwise, it is not uh, so clear. I mean, I don't find it so natural. And that, that's why the result by Flandoli is remarkable, because he solves, the, he, he obtains the solution of the Euler equation as unique limit of smooth solution for the equation, which are known since Judovich. And previous work, like the one by Albeveri or Cosero, they don't connect their solutions to smooth flow of, of the Euler equation. That was the main novelty of the recent paper by Franco. So I think that this should be the philosophy. We, if you are in a situation the problem has global smooth solutions, the limit object should be related to the smooth flow. Otherwise, I at least don't find this natural. And so I will do exactly this. I will take my white noise initial data, and I will convolve it. So as you see, I take a particular approximation. I take approximation by convolution. And so I take the following uh, U0n, I call it like this, U0n omega. I'm sorry, the omega now goes upstairs, here is downstairs. But it is simply the truncation of the Fourier series, the Dirichlet truncation. So now this is a perfectly defined same infinity function. As you see, actually, I can take even more general truncation, but it's just, uh, just a convolution with some kernel such that the Fourier transform is uh, of type theta of n minus n with theta some localized bound function on R. So if I take theta to be the characteristic function of uh, minus 1, 1, I obtain this uh, truncation. But uh, uh, as you see, <laughs> I don't take the more natural convolution, which is to have a, a bump function which is with compact support in X. I take which is with compact support in Fourier. Of course, uh, I strongly believe that our proof generalizes to the other convolution, but already our paper is too technical. So we, it's a question of checking that all the things are okay in our proof to go from one to another convolution. Okay. You see, what I take by convolution is this rho n is not with compact support in x. It's in compact support in the Fourier side. But OK, it's, uh, I think it's a natural truncation. And so this will be my truncation of the initial data, uh, this approximation of the initial data. And for this approximation of the initial data, I can define a global solution u omega n of my equation, which is, in fact, a global smooth solution with this data. So my data if is the truncated white noise. And with truncated white noise, I have global smooth solution by the fact that I have a global flow for this equation. And then the whole issue of solving the problem with this initial data is whether this sequence has a limit. If it has a limit, for me, I solved the problem in some sense. If it has a unique, if it had a limit up to subsequence, then I obtained weak solution. If the whole 
sequence converge, I obtain uh, strong solution. That's my philosophy. <laughs> and of course, the, unfortunately, there it's not proven, but essentially there is a U pod that is a result of GU O shows that this sequence has no chance to have a convergence in any space. <laughs> and uh, I don't have time to explain why. However, what, what is turning out is that if I multiply this sequence by some random oscillation of module one, so Cn is a random, real random variable, and of course it goes to plus infinity, as n goes to infinity, actually it's positive. So it's a diverging sequence, highly oscillating random sequence. If I multiply by such a highly oscillating random sequence, then the sequence of the, uh, the, of the smooth solution has a limit. And that's the way the, the solution is defined. So I take the natural approximation of uh, smooth uh, functions. And this sequence of smooth solutions of the equation with truncated data doesn't have limit, even if it's not proven formally, but I strongly believe it doesn't. However, if you multiply it by some strongly said, well, it has a limit. That's what I call renormalization. After this renormalization, there is a limit. And that's what I'm saying in the next slide. Let us, so this is a soft formulation of our result. So the soft formulation of our result is as follows. So I write it slightly differently, but it's the same. As you see, the oscillating factor looks more complicated on the slide than what I wrote. But it's the, it is independent of, uh, you see, what we say is that uh, actually the sequence alone doesn't have limit. But if I multiply it by this huge factor, actually it looks very big on the, on the, on the, on the slide, but actually this doesn't depend on x, okay? It's only depending on t, and it's a complex number of modulus one. Okay, so the main part of the sequence is this small guy <laughs> because it's a really function of x which is very singular. So what I say is that this sequence converges almost surely in continuous functions with better fit hs for s more than minus one half. So I wrote it slightly differently. I just say that because the L2 norm is conserved, this guy is the same in time t and time zero. And in fact, by Plauser inequality, I even have an expression for my Cn. Actually, Cn omega there is something like this. So this is the oscillating factor. Exponential et, the sum of the first n Gaussian square. This is the renormalization factor. It's very explicit, in fact, even if it may look. I write it like this because that's the way you prove it, in fact. OK. so. And then this was the part of solving, as I say, we solved the equation with this initial data. That's my way to say that I solved the equation. And then you, as a byproduct, you also have uh, the invariance of the white noise. What does it mean? It means that if I take later times in time bigger than t, I can still develop my solution in that way, right? I, I, the, the initial data is something like this, all Gaussians. And so for later times, I have some other Gaussians, which are G, N, this is the T. And actually, a priori, they are not Gaussians. It's just some function of the T and G1, G2, N up to infinity. Right? This is the, this is, I say nothing. Just I write that the solution in time T depends on the infinitely many Gaussians I had at zero. And so it's a kind of absolutely crazy combination of the Gaussians, right? <laughs> at time t, it's nonlinear PDE. So it's really very nonlinear function of the Gaussians. But since we are, we are in, uh, in uh, dealing with the solution of my par particular problem, this random variable follows the law of uh, the complex Gaussians. <laughs> and more importantly, they are all mutually independent. So it's remarkable, right? So you take your solution, it evolves under your equation, and after time t, there is uh, the development. However, it still keeps the, the, the Gaussians, and uh, they still remain independent. 
that's a way to formulate the invariance of the, of the white noise. So this, of course, a remarkable statement. And for me, it's not only a statement of the regular solution. It's a statement of nice, uh, of a singular solution. It's also a statement of nice property of smooth solutions. In fact, you have smooth solutions which somehow behave at the limit as white noise. It means that if I can say that for very large n, I have a smooth solution which is close to something like this, which I think itself is interesting already. And uh, let me now compare because I mentioned the paper by Franco. So Franco Flandoli proves similar result in the context of Euler equation. Of course, it's if the 2D Euler equation on the torus. Of course, everything here is in 2D. So what are the differences? The difference is that Franco doesn't need to, to make this uh, uh, real normalization for the Euler equation. It's not needed. But what is the most important difference? That's why it's a weak solution, that the limit is only uh, modulus some uh, subsequence. And also, the approximation is not by convolution. It's, uh, it's related. So the, the result of Franco is as follows. There exists an approximation of the white noise such that the corresponding smooth solution have a subsequence converging as, as here, not the whole. So the, the cover and so how he proves? He proves it by using this delta function approximation and the work by uh, Pulverenti and Marcus. So it's very nice paper. I, if you have, to, I can, I profit to advertise and also in Italy. So, uh, of course, he proves less, but still I find very interesting for the Euler equation. Okay, and now uh, I emphasize that we only obtain this limit for some particular approximation of the initial data, not any approximation. So we have room, actually, we can prove our result really down to Schrodinger. If you prove here, if you take here uh, minus d square alpha, we still works as far as alpha is bigger than one. Actually, our proof works down to Schrodinger, but it completely breaks down for Schrodinger. <laughs> and that's why, okay, we wrote it for the fourth order because it's more a fancy equation, but it would work uh, down to the fraction of Schrodinger with dispersion slightly bigger than two. So we didn't write the details, but it's, it's true. But there is a really important uh, thing to do to go to alpha equal to y. It's not technical. So. We should admit that in the, in the present moment, we don't know how to deal with the usual NLS. Neither from this approach, we are epsilon close by this method. And maybe integrability people also will get closer. So in my opinion, in the future years, we will solve the problem for the true Schrodinger equation. But for the moment, we know how to solve it with slightly more dispersion. And I will try to convince you that the analysis offers new features compared to previous works on similar problems. That will be the goal of my, of the remainder part of my talk, at least. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to mention that for KDV this problem is solved, but in this case the problem is much easier. And the reason is that for KDV the local well poisonous on the is purely deterministic. As Sergei mentioned, by coupler to power, we can solve it in a deterministic way. We have several different proofs. I mentioned all contributors here. So for KDV, the problem is easier. And in fact, it's deterministic. And the fact that we solve the Cauchy problem in a deterministic way has an impact. The impact is here, that for KDV, one can show the convergence of the sequence or for any regularization of the initial data. And without renormalization, without this, uh, so for KDV, you don't need this. But what is more important for KDV, <laughs> uh, here I don't need for KDV to take regularization by convolution or trocation of the Fourier transform. The result, uh, the deterministic results of the people mentioned there, says that any approximation of the white noise by some smooth functions. Then we uh, give a sequence of smooth solution which converge in the appropriate topology. So as you see, for KDV, <laughs> problem is somehow deterministic because it is any approximation would give uh, uh, the same limit. My, uh, the problem really relies on probabilistic methods, 
when the limit I obtain depends on the approximation. And so I strongly, it was the case in our papers with Nicola Burk for the wave equation, and I strongly believe it will be the case for, for the NLS uh, white noise data. In any case, for the moment, as you see, I don't claim that any approximation give a limit. I just claim that I have one approximation giving limit, and no, nobody excludes that the other one will give a limit. So the parallel with stochastic integral is very natural here, as you know. You have uh, the analog of the smooth flow would be stiltus integral. And then, depending on the approximation, you have different limits. So no, something like this is not excluded for this kind of PDE. So, OK, uh, where is technically why the problem is more difficult? Because the important property of KDV equation, as many people here know, is the absence of resonances when we restrict to zero mean uh, uh, for, uh, solutions. And so the fact that you don't have these resonances gives some very nice regularization property that even if your data is so, uh, very singular, the remainder part of the solution becomes much more regular because of absence of uh, resonances and even very strong regularization. In our case, even if we can remove a large part of the resonances as was done yesterday by Andre, still there are some resonances remaining, as Sergei would say, the integral part of the equation, and actually, this integral part of the equation makes our life difficult. That's the, the difficulty here. OK. Hmm? Oh, I, uh... No, it's not the zero for remote. The problem are the resonances. The zero for remote is one thing. The other thing is that there are many resonances for NLS which are not up, uh, there for KDV. For KDV, the resonant function, so it becomes a bit special. For KDV, the resonant function is n, n1, n minus n1. And as far as O modes are different from zero, this very huge guy. For NLS, the resonant function is something like this. So there are four. So this can, uh, can vanish. And even by this uh, renormalization, like Andreas said, you can remove some of the resonances. There is one, the integrable one, which remains. And for us, it's a problem. We should deal with it. This, this, this contains the main part of the solution. And for our perturbative methods on low regularity, this is an issue. But of course, as you know, it is uh, the, one, the thing which is, OK, we'll discuss this later. But there is. Uh, not only the zero mode, the fact that there are resonances uh, which remain. If you prefer for KDV, the only resonance is at zero, and you can queue it by reducing to zero, uh, to mean value zero solutions. For uh, NLS, you can remove many resonances by the trick Andre explained yesterday, but still there is one remaining. I'm sorry it becomes very specialized discussion. <laughs> I understand that people who are not in the field don't understand what I talk about. I'm sorry. Uh, OK. So, OK, we will now see this uh, removing of resonances. So let us now, uh, actually, I did this presentation of the main result because it was more uh, somehow natural way to say uh, the only thing we needed to know is that we can solve the problem with uh, regular data. But let us now try to explain a more precise formulation of the result. The interest of this formulation is not only that it's more precise, it is also that with this formulation we will see a more precise structure of the solution. And this is really the novelty of what we do. So the, uh, however, we will now see in which sense the obtained limit satisfy a limit equation and you give a description of the solution. So for that purpose, we do exactly what uh, Andre did yesterday. So I'll be quick. So the way you can see the, the change of the equation he did yesterday is the following one. So if you take a solution of your equation, and if you make the phase change we already saw, then the changed function by this change of variable. So you take u multiplied by this modulus of one factor which, you know, it doesn't depend on x. So this new function satisfies the equation, which is very close to the first one, but better. <laughs> it is better because it erases this L2 norm, and this makes some, uh, some uh, uh, resonance term disappearing. I will explain later. And so, in fact, in the whole work, we don't solve the original equation, which is written here. 
We solve really this equation, as uh, Andre and Sergey did yesterday. And uh, so this, uh, the point is that we will solve the equation with data which is in negative Sobolev spaces, which means that L2 norm is infinite. So you, you see the row of the, this renormalization. So essentially here is, there is a huge simplification because my solution will be in, in some infinite L2 norm, but the difference of these two guys makes sense. So essentially, written like this, the equation doesn't make sense for data which is not in L2, but the difference makes sense, especially if you write it on the Fourier side. So uh, what I will solve is this equation with this nonlinearity interpreted in the Fourier side. But as you see, uh, I try to make this message. For me, it's not so important which is the limit in the equation. For me, wh what is important is to make a limit in the approximate solution, to take such a limit. If I take the limit, then somehow the fact that I solve the equation, in which sense, it's you know, less important for me. The important is really a, a limit of some, and this is from probabilistic viewpoint exactly what we, you do all the time, right? I mean, but for PDE people, it's less natural because we have this distribution theory and we have some, right, you should solve in the sense of distribution. So I start to believe that actually the important point is really the limit. And this I learned from probabilists. So this is a more, uh, this is a more, uh, uh, a more uh, precise version of the main result. So what we say is that Take uh, the solution of the of the problem with renormalized uh, nonlinearity. Then uh, you can uh, uh, then you can write. Uh, uh, with, with initial data by the white noise, then you have uh, a solution which is given by some main term plus something which is uh, more uh, regular, okay? And then, in fact, uh, what happens is that, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, here, if I don't have this oscillating factor, I simply have the free evolution starting from, uh, from the white noise. This is the ma main novelty. The main novelty is that I put in, the, in the each term of this decomposition some uh, strongly oscillating factor. And so this is the structure of the solution. Instead of having free solution plus something more regular, the solution is something like this uh, series. So this is the main novelty, is that in fact the solution belongs to this sum. So as you see, this is the, uh, this is the free evolution oscillation. And here I take, this is the nonlinear effect. So I should write this with other, with other cover. This is which, this, term makes the result new and interesting. And then I have the Fourier coefficient of the initial data, plus something more regular. So this is the structure of the solution. And so this uh, one written in blue is an uh, uh, additional oscillation we take into account and uh, which, makes that, which makes our life difficult. How to justify such a decomposition of the solution where a, a truly nonlinear effect is taken into account of the main part of the solution. And in fact, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, the limit uh, we obtain in the soft formulation of the result after the multiplication by Cn is actually the same solution I write here. Okay, there is no miracle. <laughs> Uh, I said that there is a limit. Actually, the limit solves this uh, renormalized equation, right? But I prefer to formulate it like this. Otherwise, uh, we should motivate this equation. And uh, the singular complementary solution is consulting arbitrary high powers of the random initial data. What I mean by this, it will be clear, I hope, in the next slide. So this is the structure of the solution. And so I would try now to compare. I have how much time now? 15 minutes or a bit less? 
Oh, good. Uh, I, I still, okay. So I will, however, spend time here even if I sacrifice any technicality. So I think this is the important slide. Uh, because, uh, in fact, uh, if you, you know, I do something a bit stupid here, but it is important. This exponential, I can develop it as a sum of the, you know, exponential, the, de the development of exponential as sum of uh, t to the power n over n factorial. So if I develop this exponential, I can see this guy as a sum of multilinear expressions with respect to the initial Gaussians, which are ordered by their orders. And so the expression of order 2k plus 1 is this one. As you see, this is a kind of gn to the power 2k gn. So this is a 2k plus 1 uh, uh, multilinear expression with respect to the initial data. And I claim that this comes from the k plus 1 Pickard iteration. So what I mean by this? I would, uh, if I explain this, I am satisfied by my talk, uh, because that's the main message. Essentially, I need to solve my equation. No matter, if, in fact, what is the equation. And actually, uh, the initial data is some initial data, which is my white noise. And so, Formally, at least, I can solve any equation if I, do, I was doing algebra by the Pickard iteration. What is the Pickard iteration? I just re recall the Pickard iteration is to consider the sequence which starts by zero and such that each next step of the iteration, I, I solve the linear equation. with the prescribed initial data. So this is the Pickard iteration. And one thing which is good in the Pickard iteration is that at least formally, you can of course write the series if you are, if you are, if you are interested, and say that in fact your solution has the following structure. The solution of the equation, at least formally, is written as a sum of Q1 of u0, so a linear part of u0. This is the free evolution. Because it's a cubic equation, the next one will be u1, u1, u1. It's a trilinear part of the solution, which is simply trilinear expression of the data. You see, what is the first picker iteration? If I take u0, 0, zero is the linear evolution, which is linear with respect to u0. The next iteration is I take the first to the cube. So it becomes a trilinear expression of the initial data. So the structure, formal structure, this is algebra. The formal structure of the solution is like this. So because it's cubic, the next one will be a five linear expression. And then the next one will be seven linear expression. And so on. Actually, only the... In So when I write seven times, it's seven, seven linear expression, and then infinitely many linear expression of u0. So this is the structure of the solution. This is the algebraic structure of any solution of any PDE of this type. Of course, once I write this uh, development, I do not think from analytic viewpoint because I should say where this expression makes sense, right? And so what happens is that, uh, in fact, I can write formally this expression. And as you see, there are linear, bilinear, trilinear, four linear, uh, bilinear, trilinear, five linear, seven linear, and so on. So what I say is that this expression here is a 2k plus 1 linear uh, expression with respect to the initial data, right? Which takes OGN in this particular way. So I say that this is a part of the 2k plus, uh, of the 2k plus 1 linear expression defining the iteration. It came at the k plus 1 step of the iteration. So I don't take the whole iteration. I take just the singular part of the iteration. And then I just say that my solution is this singular part I was intelligent enough to identify. And the whole remainder part of the, of the solution, I treat it in a deterministic way. This is the whole philosophy of 
uh, it, from my viewpoint, of, of rough paths or, or what people do in stochastic PD. Because what I say has exactly the same formulation in the work of singular stochastic PD. The only thing which changes in my iteration is that the data will be, say, zero, and there will be the noise here. But it will be the same the structure of the solution. So what I would like to say today, the main message of my talk is how we proceed. We take this expansion. And we try to be intelligent enough which is the singular part of the solution. And if you find it, then we say this is the singular part of the solution. And all remainder part, I do it in deterministic way. So the ideal situation is when there is no singular part of the solution. It means that everything is done by deterministic way. In many works, only the first part of the solution is the singular, and all remainder is done in a deterministic way. That's the, what we would call the prato de Bustrick or the Burgen argument for invariant measure. In the works by Heyer and things on stochastic PD, I claim that there are only finite many picker iterations which gives the singular part of the solution, and all remainder part is uh, in the deterministic analysis, even if it's would become very complicated. In this case, because of the kind of integrability, we are lucky enough to have contribution of any picker iteration to the singular part of the solution. And of course, the remainder part is again done by deterministic. So the philosophy remains the same. And I would say that the novelty in this result is that each picker iteration, or if you prefer, each term of this expansion contri contributed to the singular part of my solution. Of course, as we will see later, this works because there is some integrability of some of the resonant part of the equation is integrable. <laughs> That's why this integral equation contributes to any order. And if you take the methods for, say, KPZ or, or uh, this phi tree for number, they don't have such integrability, but th they take several terms and then all the remainder is uh, OK. So this is the main message of my talk, if, uh, what I just said. OK, so this is somehow comparing to stochastic PDE. And this is somehow the novelty of the result. But of course, I should admit that we didn't solve the true problem, which would be endless, right? <laughs> so let us now compare to the work of Bourguin. And actually, it's more or less the same thing, huh? is that Bourguin uh, actually solved uh, this problem for uh, the Gibbs measure. So the Gibbs measure is something which is easier in a sense, but he did it in 2D. <laughs> so for the Gibbs measure, you should divide the Fourier coefficient by some decaying factor, like this. So that's what Borgen did. And in fact, in his paper, he proved that the solution is the linear evolution plus smoother term. Essentially, only keeps Q10, and all other terms are done by his complicated Fourier transform restriction method, but deterministically. And this is, uh, our structure is quite different. We take a nonlinear function of the initial data plus a smoother term. And so what happens is that he, actually Borgen can also do like us, but he, he doesn't, because, you know, I had this correction term. There. In the case of the Gibbs measure, it should be divided by n, uh, sorry, this 1 plus n squared, 1 half. And you see that for very large n, this is like 1, you know, just because of this decay. So our result is, I think, also true in Burgen case, but of course he doesn't do it because he realizes that the singular part is only q1. And of course there is a price to pay, I, I didn't say, because the, 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 the philosophy in this work is to choose as much as you need term in the singular part of the solution. But if you put more term in the singular part of the solution, the probabilistic analysis becomes harder because you, you take more information that you should be able to analyze. That's why it's not a very good idea to put too many terms in the probabilistic side. Because <laughs> otherwise, somebody would say, why you don't treat all the terms probabilistically? Because then it becomes an untreatable problem from the viewpoint of the probabilistic effects. So somehow there is a delicate analyst. You should put some, something in the probabilistic part, but not too much. Because if you put too much, you need to do more probability. So what we do in our result is we put more things in the probabilistic part. 
We, in that sense, I think our result is harder than Borgen from this viewpoint because we have more probabilistic income, but the deterministic income in Borgen result for the 2D NLS is harder because he's with 2D problem and then the, the deterministic part is, is harder. So uh, somehow the two <laughs> results can be compared like this. In what I explained, the probabilistic part is more refined, but since we are 1D in the deterministic part, we should suffer less than Borgen. And in his case, he's lucky enough to have this oscillation. So he doesn't keep the whole, the whole guy, only one at that place, so less probabilistic information, but much more deterministic analysis. So that's somehow the, my viewpoint on these problems. Okay, and uh, so <laughs> in, in, in this analysis, we uh, have this uh, new feature that we have nonlinear. So let me just make a digression. So when discussing his result on the TD LLS, Borgen is uh, writing, he's of course familiar with what he's doing, and he says the solution is linear evolution plus smoother term, and he's writing this property reminds scattering occurring in some dispersive model. Scattering means that at the infinity, your solution is like a free evolution. And that's, you just need to make the vocabulary change. You remove decay. You replace decay, the word decay, with the word regularity, and you have this property. <laughs> and so, amazingly enough, this phrase was very motivating for me when I worked on this project. Because, in fact, we <laughs> our result, in fact, in this vocabulary of Borgen, is a modified scattering result. And, in fact, I don't have time to enter into the details, but our proof is very close philosophically to the proof we did with Hani, Pauzader, and Vichilia on the growth of Sobolev norm. Just, of course, in my brain, I replace uh, decay with uh, regularity. <laughs> but then the structure, the, the annulations are very close to each other. So it's the same philosophy. If you listen to some talk of me on the growth of Sobolev, <laughs> here we do the same philosophy. Of course, the technicalities are different. But the main, uh, the main viewpoint is the same. Uh, OK. And so let me now go quickly. Uh, yeah, I will go very quickly. I have five minutes. Of course, I will not. Uh, so uh, this, this is the splitting. Our nonlinearity can be split by resonant part. And no, this is the non-resonant part. OK, it becomes technical. But it's, this part, if I don't have, this is the important restriction. N2 is different from N1 entry. If I don't have this, it is simply the nonlinearity u cube. This is the linear, the non-resonant part. And this is the bad part, in fact, for us. This is the reason, as you see, there is one resonance remaining, this one. And so this one, I should keep it. And the, this one is non resonant because of some, uh, this arithmetical property. And if I put four, I, I gain two, but I need to gain epsilon here, which would be the case if I have two plus something. But for the true Schrodinger, there is no factor here, and I don't know what to do. If I only epsilon gain in the resonant relation is sufficient for our method. Then, uh, if you, so I have my nonlinearity like this to term. This is the bad term. So the natural answer is to say, OK, I, I will just take the solution of the equation where I only keep the resonant part. So this is something uh, Sergei and Herschel did a big business with many years ago, right? Because that's the way you could start quasi-linear solutions, right? In the KM uh, theory of uh, Sergei and, and Puschel, that's exactly what they do. Because if you take the resonant part of the equation, and you, it's solvable explicitly. That's why I go to infinitely many Picard iterations. And it's given by this representation. So this is uh, the explicit solution of the, singular, of the, of the resonant uh, equation. And so uh, what uh, I would, you, you see, if I don't have this oscillation, I am periodic in time, right? Because n squared is integer. But if I put here some uh, coefficients which are different, it becomes quasi-periodic, or even almost periodic in time. That's precisely, the ba from my viewpoint, the basic thing you do with Pyrschel when you construct quasi-linear solution for NLS. You just take the quasi-linear part, the integrable part, it introduces this quasi-linear oscillation, and you construct that by KM theory, the remainder part, is a perturbation. So in a sense, we do the same thing here, but for low regularity solution, and so on. And so you can see that the modified scattering is the same type of mathematics. And so <laughs> this is what uh, the place we, we really do something non-perturbative non by solving explicitly this equation. And then, uh, OK, now 
uh, I, if I put the white stone here, all this u0 hat is gn. And so the main idea is to say my solution is this term plus something more regular. And then uh, it, during more than one year, we were stuck because even if you believe that this is the main solution, it's not clear what to do. <laughs> and so the main point is that one should make a gauge transform. So solving the equation for you, we did not succeed to justify this decomposition, but we succeeded to justify it after performing a gauge transform. And this gauge transform is very nice, and I will quickly say what she does, and I stop. So the interest of this transform is that the equation becomes different. Now, <laughs> the randomness goes to the to the nonlinearity. So it becomes, it's not, of course, white noise or any random forcing. But what I have is that the new equation has a better resonant term and worse non resonant term. Okay? And so why I don't have time to explain? So maybe I, I, I stop here. So the, the point is that I should, I make this gauge transformation, which makes that the non resonant part of the equation is worse because of this random oscillation, and this is the this is what makes the life difficult. But I'm lucky that in the resonant part, I erase uh, the initial data, which makes that I can, uh, now this is suitable for uh, low regularity analysis. Okay, so this is the point. And this gauge transform was, once we have this, I started to believe that, uh, so we make, you make the computation here, there is a key cancellation, exactly the same type as for the modified scattering. So here is the place the experience with modified scattering was crucial <laughs> because the same type of cancellation occurs. And then we realize that this point is, uh, has no no resonant interaction. Okay, once you write this, we start to believe that this approach worked. And indeed, after suffering some time, we wrote a paper which is available. And uh, I think I'll stop here because I, I'm over the time. And I think I explained the main message which was over there. So I'm sorry to be over the, uh, over the time. Sorry.